Yes, hello and welcome to a new video. Today I have a guest from Crimea and that is Regis Tremblay. Good evening, Regis. Nice to have you here. Hello, Hendrik. Always good to see you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for your time. Um, Regis, we have done a video for one year ago, so it's not necessary to introduce you completely because people can still find this video on my channel. But uh, of course, we have to say you are a um, citizen from the United States and you live on Crimea uh, already four years, if, I, if I'm right. Is, correct. Is it right? That's correct. Yes. And you are a filmmaker. You are making films, videos, and shows uh, with a lot of in, um, interested people. And you have your own channels. And we put, of course, all these links to these channels in the description box down below this video so people can find you and all your guests you have. You are you're really uh, busy and doing a lot of videos. Uh, I think it's uh, three or four a week, I would say, maybe. <laughs> Is it right? Yeah, sometimes more, Hendrik. Okay. There's so, okay. so much so much going on in the world and so many people have very interesting comments and observations that it's keeping me busy. Yes, yes. But you have to have the time for this and you have this time because you're doing this professionally. So that's well, uh, really but good. I'm, I'm, I'm also retired. And so <laughs> I have all the time in the world to do what I want and what I like. That's that's right. That's right. Okay. Today I want to talk with you about the situation on uh, Crimea. As you know, of course, you are following Western media as well. Um, we hear already since 2014, since the reunification of Crimea with Russia, that uh, the situation on Crimea is terrible. Uh, people want back to Ukraine. Uh, all this we have heard now in 10 years. Um, but since um, special military operation starts uh, in 2022, uh, in February, there is also shelling on Crimea. And uh, that's maybe for many people the most interesting thing. How is the situation right now on Crimea? Is there shelling every day or is it one time a week or a month? Or, or what can we, uh, what is the situation there? Yeah, well, for the last couple of months, the shellings and mostly drone attacks, um, aerial drones and even naval drones, which attacked the bridge in, in Kerch and have damaged it on two occasions, are completely repaired now. The other attacks have focused mainly on Sevastopol, which is the headquarters of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea. Um, the reports are conflicting, Hendrik. If mm -hmm. you listen to Ukraine, Ukraine will say that they've, they've caused a lot of damage. They've sunk two or three Russian ships. And then if you listen to the Russian side, they have not done any of that. They have not sunk recently two Russian ships. It's hard mm. to believe what what has really happened because this is war and the first thing to die in war is the truth. And that is for strategic and defensive and offensive purposes. Mm. What, I, what I can tell you, Hendrik, the mood here is calm. Nobody anywhere, including Sevastopol, is living in fear. Nobody. People here feel very protected. Um, I think they, they feel very confident in the Russian Federation, the government, and the military to have fortified this peninsula and people are saying it's one of the most fortified places in Russia besides the Kremlin. 
As you know, Hendrik, Ukraine has stated publicly many times they want to take Crimea back. When Crimean people hear that, they laugh. They say, we will never go back. The Crimean people voted overwhelmingly. Some 97% of the people here who voted, voted to return to Russia. In these 10 years, the improvements here have been miraculous. Uh, everything, new highways, the Kerch Bridge, new industry, new infrastructure, new hospitals, new schools. People here are doing extremely well. There's construction going on everywhere you go. You can see construction cranes. They're all working. Hmm. So, Hendrik, that's kind of a long answer, but people here are living life as we always have, quite normally doing everything we always do and not worrying about looking up to see what might be above. Okay. Um, there was a leak um, two or three weeks ago from uh, uh, three or four German military generals who had an online interview or an online conversation about how to destroy the Crimean bridge with uh, German delivered missiles. Uh, was that a topic in Crimean media or did state officials say something about that or, or people on the streets, how react, how was their reaction to, to this leak? Yeah, it was covered in, uh, in Russian sources such as RT and Sputnik. Uh, nobody, nobody here took it really seriously. I think You know, the foreign media, the American media really made a big deal out of this. Um, I personally, I'm not sure what the significance of that leaked conversation really meant. Um, I think if you combine that with the president of France, Macron, who has been creating all kinds of a stir of wanting to send NATO troops to Ukraine and coming out publicly and clearly saying we cannot afford for Ukraine to lose. I think when you put these things together, I think you can see how desperate the United States and its vassals in Europe and NATO are. They, they have nothing left but fear. Um, they've been defeated in Ukraine. Uh, Russia has been going about this very slowly, but definitely. And I think that with the problems in the United States, in the Congress, not wanting to send more money right now to Ukraine, The EU is likewise bankrupt. They're going to send, I don't know, a few million euros, whatever they're going to send. But they're basically admitting that they're out of ammunition to send to Ukraine. So when you put these things together, for me, Hendrik, I think they're desperate. I think the only thing they have now is fear and terrorism. Terrorist attacks on Crimea, Belgorod, and even on uh, deeper into Russia. Mm. Those are my thoughts. One more question to the military situation. Uh, you mentioned that Crimea maybe is the best fortified uh, place in Russia. Uh, but is it that military people, uh, military soldiers or something standing on the streets or in, in, are they visible in the cities or, or how, how can we that, think that's about that? A really good, that's a really good question. Where I live in Yalta, you don't see any military, none whatsoever. All we hear is an occasional airplane and it's a Russian military airplane because 
the airspace here, as you know, has been closed. An occasional helicopter might land not far from where I live, a military helicopter. I can see it from out my window. I don't know what they're doing. But I have to tell you this. On recent trips that I've made to Simferopol and Sevastopol, you do not see military on the street. There was a government building in Sevastopol where I saw an armed guard outside the building. But what you do see are regular troop transports, these trucks that are covered with canvas and camouflage on top, and there'll be a lot of soldiers in there. Uh, they move about freely. I, I have been told that they have training bases. And I've been told that they uh, have actual military bases somewhere in that part of Crimea, which is looking towards Odessa and which is looking towards the, the, the Azov Sea. But you don't see them in public. You don't see anybody with guns walking around except what I said that one occasion outside of a government building that there was a soldier with a machine gun. Okay. Yes. Let us talk about the presidential election. Um, oh. In 2014, Crimea was uh, reunified with Russia and the support for President Putin was really high. Um, how was the situation now in this last election? Um, did you know the results for, for Crimea? Oh, the vast majority of people, like in the rest of Russia, voted overwhelmingly for President Putin. You can see billboards here. You can see the sides of buildings that have been painted with Putin's image. When, when you talk to ordinary people here, they love President Putin for what he's done to improve their life here in Crimea. Now, he got 87% of the vote of all Russians. There were three other people who were in the election. They're members of smaller parties. They are real and viable candidates, but they have nowhere near the support that President Putin had. For me, and I've said it several times, that election was a statement about the unity of the Russian people, given not only what's going on in Ukraine, but given the stated goal of the United States of America was to inflict a strategic defeat on Russia. The people understand, and Putin has articulated this several times, as have Lavrov and the spokespersons for the foreign ministry and Putin. They understand that this is a war of the United States of America, whoever is controlling that, against Russia. And so that election was a statement that showed the unity, the resolve, the determination, and the confidence they have in President Putin, who's now going to begin a new term, mm. unprecedented in Russia. And so the people are confident in him. And I think that that was a statement to the rest of the world, including the Western world, that the people are united behind their president, although that is not how they portrayed it. I no. think in the rest of the world that is friendly to Russia, and that means the majority of the people in this world and the governments, the countries in this world, are happy that President Putin was elected for another term. I, I think so too, of course. Uh, Regis, you have, you have lived your whole life in, in the U.S., and I was living in, in Europe all my life. Um, when you talk about the unity uh, of the Russian people, 
uh, how would you compare this unity to the unity of people in in the US or in in Europe well I can't speak personally for Europe but um, I have lived most of my adult life in the United States I've traveled extensively I studied in Rome for four years and traveled throughout Europe and that was back in the late 60s and early 70s but what I can tell you about the United States, it is a country that is so divided, deeply divided over so many issues. I, I cannot recognize the country of my birth today. If you look at the two political parties, they pretend to be against each other, but they're really together. On, on, when it comes to war, when it comes to foreign policy, they're one and the same. But the people in America, if you look at this upcoming election, are so deeply divided between Joseph Biden and Donald Trump. The two of them basically are one and the same. But the way they've been presented to the public is that Donald Trump is a danger to democracy. He's a madman. And if you elect him, everything is going to be bad. We're going to lose our freedom. And then I believe there's a majority of the people in the country that have no longer confidence in Joe Biden. His approval rating is less than 40%, maybe closer to 20%. The reports that come out daily that he doesn't have it together, continually making gross mistakes, not knowing where he is, confusing countries. And this is supposed to be the most powerful person in the world. And this is what America has to choose from in this upcoming election this year. People are divided over immigration. People are divided over religion. People are divided over LGBTQ, transgender, sexuality. I, I, I cannot believe the state that the United States is in today. I have said for a long time, the United States has lost its moral compass. The United States has given up its traditional values that most of us grew up believing in, God, country, family, the traditional values, religion. When I was growing up, everybody was participating in Christian religions, Jewish faith. I never saw much of the Islamic faith uh, where I lived and in other parts of the country where I lived, but there was no animosity at, at that time. Today, those divisions are so deep. I'm terribly disturbed about the state of the United States of America. It is not united. They're spending over a trillion dollars a year on war, endless war. And I do believe that people are getting tired of that, but they have not yet united in a real existential way. I think I would say the same thing for Europe too. Um, we are not uh, united at all. It's uh, the C virus pandemic goes uh, through families, split families, uh, as you say, LGBT plus and all these uh, discussions are uh, dividing families and, and friends. Um, so we are in a really difficult situation. Um, so it's a, if I understand you right, you will say it's a complete misunderstanding if we in the West think that Russia is divided and people are against the president because uh, they don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a complete distortion. I'd even, I'm even going to say flat out, they're lies. They are lying completely and regularly, always. 
against how they present Russia. It's just not the way they're presenting it. I can talk about the United States because I see it with my own eyes and I have friends there and um, yeah, total distortion, Hendrik. Okay. Uh, you mentioned already that a lot is going on on Crimea when it comes to building of infrastructures and uh, other developments. Uh, let us talk a little bit about that. Um, this is going on, if I understand right, since 2014 already, since the reunification, because uh, the Russian government started directly to put a lot of money into Crimea to bring it up to a, to a level, to a Russian standard level, if I understand right. Well, the first time I came here was two years after the referendum in 2016. And my first impression was this place is kind of dilapidated. Um, there were a lot of buildings that were run down. Um, the highways, I, I mean, my gosh, if people joked about it, you know, you had to navigate through potholes on major highways. And I came back again in 2018, in 2019, for a period of a little more than one month in each of those years. And what I saw as I traveled, not only around Crimea, but around different parts of Russia, was a real significant improvement, but specifically in Crimea. Now, I've been living here the past four years. And as I said earlier on in this, in this show, what has happened here is a real miracle. It's hard to believe how improved everything is, everything. You know, reports from the United States say that there's a lack of food. You know, there's a lack of, you know, water. There's a lack of everything. It's totally false. You go to the supermarkets here, and Hendrik, it's just like I experienced in the United States or anywhere else I've traveled. The supermarkets, the shelves are filled. There's so many different choices for everything. <clears throat> we do a lot of our shopping in the uh, the outdoor markets, where food comes from local farmers or comes from other countries in the region, and it's fresh, especially vegetables and fruit. Um, I. I the four years that I've been living here now, there's nothing that I might want here that I can't get when I was in America or anywhere in Europe. We lack nothing. Hmm. Uh, how is it with uh, houses, flats, places to live? Uh, they are under construction all the time, but is there enough for the people who live on Crimea or is it shortage there? Uh, there is construction going up everywhere. <clears throat> there are apartment buildings. There are resorts that are being built that I, I don't know how people are going to be able to afford that. Certainly not ordinary working people here in Yalta. But um, I'd have to say the majority of the people here are living in Soviet era, 1950s, Khrushchev, Khrushchev era housing. From the outside, they look very drab. And, you know, it's hilly here in Yalta. And so the streets wind and wind. And then you've got one apartment building a little bit higher than another building. It's, it's really quite interesting. But People have remodeled the interior of these apartments. They're very comfortable. We have air conditioning. We have heat. We have running water. Uh, uh, it, it's really very, very comfortable. We have electricity. We have Wi-Fi that's outstanding and very cheap. Same thing with television. Utility bills are low compared to 
what I was used to in the United States. Um, and so um, I think most people are probably living in these kinds of apartments, certainly the older people. There are brand new apartment buildings that, um, well, they're too expensive for me to live in, but they're quite beautiful and they seem to be full. From what I'm told, there are a lot of people from the Russian mainland, people who have made a lot of money, people from the east, from Siberia, where there's a great deal of gas and oil, and these people come here with money and they buy apartments. Um, you know, they, they'll buy a flat in some resort hotel. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that, we're living well here. We're living comfortably. Okay. <clears throat> uh, how is it uh, the job situation? Um, are people employed or is there unemployment? Is, is that a problem or is there so much to do that they <laughs> almost need more people from, from main Russia? Uh, ever since... 2014, when Russia began investing in infrastructure, if there's unemployment, it's because people do not want to work or because they feel they're overqualified and they may have university degrees, but, you know, they might be working in a, uh, a telephone, smartphone store or in a kiosk in a mall. They're, they're, they're highly educated, but there may not be enough jobs for them in this area. But I have to tell you, the population of Crimea has grown. I've heard as much as 200,000 from people from other parts of Russia who came here to work in construction, whether it be highways, and you know the new highway, Tavrida, it's breaking out, expanding all over the place. Um, the, the people that, that come here to work in construction of buildings, um, there's people coming here from other parts of Russia that came here to work in the service industries. And so this is part of this economic boom has meant an increase in population. So uh, let me add this. I have talked to younger people, younger generation, maybe in their 20s and 30s, who would say, there's no future here. We want to move to America. We want to move to Germany. We want to move to Netherlands. We want to move to another country because we can make more money. This has kind of bothered me when I've heard that from younger people, university people. What do you want to do? make money. I want to make a lot of money. So I can't believe there's a lot of unemployment here in Crimea. And from what I hear, unemployment in the rest of Russia, and Russia is a massive country, is very low. I think somewhere less than 6% now is the unemployment rate. That's pretty amazing. Mm. Um, what do you recommend to these young people when they ask you what to do or, or how to come to U.S. To, to earn a lot of money? I tell them, don't even think about going to the United States. I tell them, and I, and I, I do meet with a lot of university age, college age young people. And they have a hard time believing me as an American saying, no, no, you, you don't understand. The United States is not what you think it is. It's not what you see on TV. I said, what you have is an enormous country with tremendous opportunity for growth and development. You can find work in Russia if you're willing to go to some places that might not be like Moscow, they might not be like some of the larger cities, but there is work. And I tell them, the one thing 
that, and it's why I live here. It's because of the traditional values and life of the Russian people, the history, the culture. You will not find this anywhere else that I know of. You surely will not find it in America. And the problem is they have a hard time believing it, Hendrik. They just can't believe that there's more opportunity here for a better life than they will find in the United States and probably Europe. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that uh, these Western propaganda or, and Hollywood films uh, also was working in, in Russia all these years. And uh, people yep. saw yeah. or, or think that life in the West would be much better than in Russia. Well, I'll tell you, uh, in the four years that I've been living here, I consider myself so lucky. I've, I've had a wonderful education. I've traveled around the world. Um, but in these last four years, I tell people, I don't know what it is, if it's the Black Sea, if it's the energy that's in the soil here, but I feel years younger and I have more energy than I've ever had. And the proof of that is in the work that I'm doing. I am producing incredible amounts of content. In fact, I produced over 500 films, videos, and podcasts in four years that I've been here. I never had this much energy ever. Mm. Thank you. Crimea, thank you. Yalta, thank you, Russian Federation. <laughs> so you're not uh, considering to go back uh, to the United States? No. No. I, okay. I, I, I could not live anywhere in the United States anymore. I have children there. I would love to be able to see them. The only way we can do that is through video like this and video chats. Uh, I've, told, I've, I've told people, I really think if I had stayed in the United States, I would have died of a heart attack by now because I was so filled with anger at everything that I was seeing that was going on in the country and what the country was doing around the world. I had seen it with my own eyes and I, I was just filled with anger, and I know it would have killed me. I'm convinced I would not be alive today if I stayed there. I have friends who have not been able to leave, like I have, who are either ill uh, or they're depressed, deeply depressed, clinically depressed, and they're taking medicine, they're taking marijuana uh, to kind of relieve the symptoms uh, that they're feeling that things are not good in that country. Mm. In in your podcasts and in your videos, you're talking also a lot about uh, geopolitics with your guests, um, and and take a look in the, in the future how the world is divided or, or what uh, what is the development of the world from a unipolar to a multipolar world and all these kind of topics you are discussing in your shows. Is that a topic uh, that the normal people on Crimea are interested in or does they live their life like here in, in Norway, for example, uh, or did they think about these, these uh, geopolitical questions uh, we are standing now in, in front of? I, I would say no. Most people are concerned about earning a living, supporting their families, going to church, trying to live a normal life, realizing their country is at war. They do. There's no doubt. But... A few people, and maybe more than what I really think, some of the older people that I know, um, you know, they're in their 70s and 80s, and they watch television all the time. 
I can talk to them about geopolitical things. Some of them know about BRICS, a movement towards a new world order. Um, but I haven't found a lot of Russians who want to talk about politics. That doesn't mean there aren't a lot of Russians who are involved in talking about politics and are involved and informed in what's happening in the world. But I think just where I'm living, most people would not want to entertain those conversations. But I would like to say this. Um, my content is not just political and geopolitical. I have been producing an awful lot of content to show what Crimea is like, Crimean life, Crimean people, and what Russia and the Russian Federation is like, primarily to the United States. And so what those videos are about are culture, literature, history, antiquity, uh, development, incredible wine industry, which I'm particularly fond of. Um, and so th that has been just as large a focus on the, on the material that I'm producing primarily for the United States to show through video, through ordinary people speaking, what Russia and Russian people are really like. That's really my mission. Okay. So people can find all these videos, as I say, in your uh, different channels. And we will put all the links in the description box under this video. Um, okay, Regis, um, that was very good to get an update from Crimea from somebody who is really living there and can compare Crimea with, in your case, the USA. So uh, that was very interesting. Let us talk one more about the war who's going on in Ukraine right now. Uh, you mentioned that people are aware about it, of course, um, but there are no soldiers in the streets, as you say, at least on Crimea. Uh, what does people say about the war? Um, I, I will guess they don't want this war, but uh, they have the feeling maybe that there was no other choice. Or, or did you hear something from, from uh, people on the streets? Oh, about of course. That? Of course. Um, I think one of the tragic things is when Crimea voted overwhelmingly to return to Russia, this caused a split in families, husbands against wives. They're on both sides, different sides of the fence. Children, brothers and sisters, brother against each other now because of the conflict in Ukraine. I think most people feel it very deeply because as President Putin keeps saying, they're all Slavs. They're all brothers. They, for a long time, for, for, for most of the lives of all of these people today, they have been one country. And so this war has deeply divided many people in Crimea, especially, but I think also in Russia. Uh, there is opposition in Russia. Just as there was in America in my younger days against the Vietnam War. There are many people who are against war. And I think that um, given this election, as I just mentioned, the president re-election of President Putin, 87% of the people understand what this war is. And they all remember the great patriotic war, World War II, when nobody suffered the loss of life and destruction that Russia did, the Soviet Union. And so people feel it very deeply. Um, 
I don't think anybody would say they're in favor of war and they they like war. I think the Russian people have accepted it as a reality. It's been happening to them for centuries. Okay. Yes, Regis, uh, thank you very much for your inside information from uh, Crimea and your views, what is going on on Crimea. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, please, uh, when you see this video, go to uh, Regis' uh, different websites and, and channels and subscribe and see this content there. And... Uh, then I hope to see you soon again on Crimea, Regis. <laughs> I'll be looking forward to it, Henrik. Hopefully, maybe later this year. Thanks for having I me. Hope so. right. I hope so, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. Uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Henrik. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.